Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariam. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers very much for uh, inviting me to participate and to read this very interesting paper. So the name of the paper is The Dollar in the Global Price of Risk. I'll just say a few comments uh, at the outset, uh, just big picture comments uh, about the area that the paper is in. Okay, so there's a large and growing literature that's been revived in recent years and they're trying to understand determinants of exchange rates and this uh, the literature on exchange rates has a long and illustrious history there is a sense in which i think in more recent years it's shifted in a way so um there was always an, an understanding that exchange rates are obviously important in macro and can be very important for determining trade uh, but uh, going back for a while now, certainly back to the Bacchus and Smith puzzle, it's been increasingly clear that changes in exchange rates seem to be driven as much by the demand for financial assets as the demand for goods. Uh, and some people would argue that the goods trade and the trade deficits sometimes looks as if it is actually the uh, result of uh, demand for financial assets rather than the cause of it, although it's, it's hard to say that. Uh, and sort of the stylized fact about at the focus of this uh, demand for financial assets uh, is the role of the dollar as a global reserve currency. And this uh, seems to be then related to, the, to what appears to be the role of the, of the US as the world's banker. So if you look at the US dollar's importance in international finance, both in the invoicing of uh, trade, but also the uh, size of dollar borrowing, the size of the US stock market, it's much bigger um, as a share of the world than is the US's share at this point of GDP and certainly trade. And uh, along with this foreign governments, as, as most people know, are. Uh, large savers into U.S. bonds, as they're also uh, foreign households. There are countries that are dollarized. Uh, so clearly the dollar has a very central kind of role here. And another closely related observation is that foreign uh, financial firms intermediaries appear to borrow in U.S. dollars as do non-financial firms, both in the U.S. and abroad, as in the euro dollar market. And so that seems very related to why the US dollar is so important and relates to observation number one. And then again, related to this movements in the value of the dollar seem to largely drive the carry trade. That's been another observation that's been made. There's flight to safety into US dollar during crises. We saw this in March again with the COVID crisis where uh, the dollar appreciates all of a sudden. And then also related to this is a set of results that's come out that U.S. monetary policy, that is the, the monetary policy decisions of the Fed, seem to have a stronger impact on uh, international markets, such as stock markets, uh, than do other central banks, including the European Central Bank. Uh, and the question I think is here in, in this literature is how to explain or model of this. And it, 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 what's, one thing that's, that's nice about it is it, that it, it really puts financial intermediation seemingly at the heart of exchange rate determination, which has been uh, a classical macro topic. But here we really have to put finance at the heart of it. And the idea here and in, in other recent papers is that dollar assets have a special safety premium or convenience yield that's important to understanding their effect, their role in the markets, in that in particular, this is not a constant amount, but that it fluctuates uh, over time. So that's an important idea. One also has to be a little bit careful about it because convenience yields, at least to me, they, they, there's, a, there's a thin line between um, important and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, free parameter in, in that sense. And one has to be careful, but it certainly seems that there's evidence to support that. And so risk takers in the model uh, buy risky assets by borrowing in this highly demanded dollar bond. This is the, the way that they'd like to borrow since uh, households want, want these dollar bonds. And then shocks to the dollar bond demand effect, which the dollar demand, uh, which the paper assumes is a kind of exogenous shock, affect risk takers and change uh, risk premia that cause equity prices in FX to change. And so my last comment as an intro here is 
uh, in more broadly is I really like the focus on risk premia. I want to understand it better in the paper. This has been something that is often or usually absent from macro and other places. There's a tendency to treat risk premia as something kind of dirty or unnecessary. And um, I'm going to uh, plug two of my own work here because I've focused with my co-authors a lot on uh, the importance of monetary policy for risk premia. We think that's maybe at least as important as its effect on uh, real rates. And the model is, uh, we've taken, so put some work in to try to understand how that may be. And that's kind of a central thing inside the model. Okay, so two questions just to, 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 to put in people's minds. Why does demand for US bonds need to move the exchange rate? That's very fundamental to understanding the model. Why doesn't it just move the relative price of US bonds uh, with respect to other things? And then why do risk tolerant investors necessarily want to find themselves in bonds since that drives a lot of what's going on? So I'll stop sharing now. Thanks a lot, Itana, for this uh, situ situating the, right, I wanna do this. Yeah, for situating the paper um, so nicely, um, this is incredibly helpful. Um, and I hope I clarify the two questions that, that you're asking um, uh, in the end during the talk, but then in the end, I hopefully we come back to this and discuss this more. So yes, joint work with Rohan Kekru from Chicago Booth, uh, who is also here and is answering questions. Um, uh, in the in the chat, the dollar and the global price of risk. The first slide is kind of just reiterating um, what Idema now nicely already did, kind of situating um, our paper uh, in both empirical facts and literature. So a, we built this paper on a growing literature um, that documents a set of key features of the US dollar as, as, as the world's reserve currency. And um, these features are first the dollar seems to be strong when measures of risk bearing capacity uh, are low, when risk premium are low, um, these are times when, 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 when the dollar is weak. Second, carry trade strategies that borrow in the US dollar seem to have counter cyclical expected returns. So in bad times, um, the strategy that these return, the returns on those strategies is higher. Third, the US net foreign asset position is rebalancing at least partially through dollar depreciation. And fourth, and this comes back to the monetary policy and risk premium story, US monetary policy shocks seem to affect the global price of risk by much more than uh, US monetary policy shocks elsewhere in the world. And this is what Ellen Ray has called the US, uh, the global financial cycle. In the literature, there's kind of two uh, disjoint sets um, of strands uh, that try to speak to these patterns that we would argue cannot jointly account uh, for all of these patterns. The first is a literature that studies this time varying um, convenience yield on, on, on dollar bonds, which naturally speaks to the carry trade uh, features of the dollar, but doesn't explicitly explain the link between, dollar, um, between the dollar and risk premium. And then second, there is a literature and this what, what Itama just called the, the US as the global banker or the US as the global insurer that the US seems to have higher risk bearing capacity and seems therefore to have this uh, levered net position relative to the world taking more um, position in risky assets while borrowing in, 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 in safe bonds. And, and these models typically suffer um, from the issue that in these models, the dollar tends to depreciate in bad times. And that's exactly because the US is the, the global insurer. So in bad times, net worth is transferred from the US uh, to the rest of the world, such that there's less demand for US goods um, in these models, which should lead to a dollar depreciation. And that's what Matteo Maggiore has called in his job market paper, the reserve currency uh, paradox. So this paper, we try to bridge these perspectives um, to, to jointly capture the features of the dollar in the data and then also do so quantitatively. And to do so, we're going to show that shocks, these time varying shocks to the demand uh, for dollar bonds, which are kind of a primitive um, for us here, we can talk more about that. These time varying shocks of demand for dollar bonds can account for all of the empirical patterns in a new Keynesian model, which has heterogeneous risk bearing capacity across agents and across countries uh, and incomplete markets. And to see why this is the case, let's consider the effect of a positive dollar demand shock, which you can think of really just like as a, an increased preference for holding dollar bonds. So what does this do? Well, this, this dollar demand shock leads to an immediate appreciation of the dollar and an expected depreciation going forward. 
this appreciation in a world with nominal uh, frictions has deflationary pressures in the US and leads to a decline in output in the US through that, uh, through that de these deflationary pressures. And this decline in US output then triggers uh, a global recessionary forces. Risk tolerant agents in our framework are going to be long risky capital and short dollars. And so both through the dollar appreciation, which increases uh, the value of the debt on the liability side, and the recessionary forces, which lower the price of capital, these risk tolerant agents are going to lose net worth in response to a dollar demand shock, which is going to raise risk premium. The US itself has is long capital and short dollar bonds, just as in the data. And that means that as a risk tolerant investor overall, the US loses net worth, which then means that the US, US net foreign asset position falls. So, the dollar demand shock single-handedly leads to a dollar depreciation, to a decline in global output, to a rise in risk premia, and to a fall in the US net foreign asset position. And it is these co-movements that then can generate the patterns that, are, that we see in the data, in particular these counter-cyclical returns on the dollar carry trade, the valuation effects in the US net foreign asset position adjustment, and then finally these asymmetries in uh, monetary policy. And just to already for, like anticipate why that is going to be the case, well, um, it is exactly in, in times of um, high uh, dollar demand that the returns on the, on the, on, uh, on the carry trade um, are going to be high, but these are also recessionary times, so these are bad times, so when output is low, returns on the carry trade are going to be um, uh, high. The US, in response to these shocks, loses net worth, and then through higher returns going forward um, and through an, a, a depreciation of its debt going forward is going to regain its uh, net foreign asset position. And finally, while monetary policy both in the US and in the world um, can stimulate the economy, an expansionary monetary policy shock will always raise the price of capital, but only US monetary policy uh, devalues the, 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 the dollar debt uh, for risk tolerant investors. And so, only US monetary policy has this effect of raising risk premia, also lowering risk premia also on the, on, the, on the liability side. So why are we doing all this? Ongoing part of our, of our analysis, and I'm gonna come back to this in the very end, um, we can then explore alternative policy rules, rules in such a, a setting, and I hope we can talk more about this then in the, at the end in the, dis, in the discussion. I'm gonna, just that we're building, of course, on a very large literature, uh, both empirically and theoretically. I just want to stress again, so we, have, we see our contribution as, as linking this literature on convenience yields and the dollar, um, and this uh, view on the US as the, as the, as the, the global insurer, the global um, bank. And through that, we can then link both the dollar and risk premium, but also overcome uh, the reserve uh, currency paradox. And we do so in a, in a quantitative application with endogenous production, which is, is, is key for some of the mechanisms um, that we are consider. So given the time today, I'm going to give you a very simple overview of the, of the model that hopefully captures the key features. Um, feel free to ask additional questions, detailed questions in, in, in the chat. Um, but I want to focus today on, on, on results and mechanisms and hope to get um, um, those along in, 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 these, in these 50 minutes. So we use a workhorse, a two country uh, international model. There's a home country, which you can think of uh, as, as the US. There's a foreign country, which we treat here as, as the rest of the world. Consumers in each country have home buyers. There's capital that can be freely deployed across countries. There are labor markets, and importantly, this is where the new Keynesian features come in. There are sticky uh, nominal wages. Now we add to this framework, a heterogeneous agents, heterogeneous risk aversion, both within and across countries. So within each country, um, there's going to be two groups, uh, which we loosely label as bankers and workers. They have abstinence and preferences, which means, which allows us to say that bankers have lower um, risk aversion but, than the workers, but both bankers and workers will have the same intertemporal elasticity uh, of substitution. So these agents can trade uh, both within and across countries, capital, and then home and foreign bonds. In the results that I'm going to show you today, and then they're doing the, there's also the main part of the model, we are not allowing for borrowing in the foreign denominated bond. And so this bond will only be priced, but not traded. Uh, in the appendix, we, we, we show that our results are, are robust to trading uh, in, the, in the foreign bond. And I'll come back to this in the end, uh, where this is actually 
uh, uh, crucial uh, that, 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 that this endogeneity is possible and can then also explain patterns in the, in the data. Can I I'll yes. jump in for one second here? I know you do talk about this at the end of the paper that it arises endogenously when you allow for uh, foreign borrowing. Um, it is an, it's important in the sense that if you remember the questions I put up, one of the questions is why do they love to borrow in the US uh, uh, dollar bond so much? And at least in the baseline model, that's the only way they can do it. So yeah. that's, that's so, an answer. It's not, I think, no, so, 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 so then let me, let me already anticipate why they're going to endogenously borrow um, in, 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 in dollars rather than in the foreign bond. It's exactly because um, what these dollar demand shocks do is uh, that the dollar bonds are appreciating in bad times, independent, they could be correlated with bad, bad, other bad shocks, but independent by themselves through their recessionary deflationary forces in the US dollar demand shocks um, are kind of bad states of the world and up states of the world in which US bonds are appreciating. So they are great hedges. And in the trade that risk tolerant agents do with risk averse agents in order to ensure these risk averse agents, when they borrow, they want to borrow in the best hedge um, relative to the risk averse agents. And the best hedge that they can offer uh, in this incomplete market setting is the dollar bond is not the foreign bond. And, and, and yeah, thanks, thank you for pointing this out. I think this is, this is, this is crucial that our, our presentation simplifies without the foreign bond trading. Uh, but endogenously, this is a, a feature that arises. Can I ask market. one yeah. small follow-up? And I yeah. understand. So you're saying that uh, because there's trade between risk averse and risk tolerant agents, then the risk tolerant agents want to sell the risk averse agents the absolute safest thing they can. And in 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 the case in the model, it's U.S. dollar bonds. Yes. Um, why though? This this might be it might be a very simple thing. Why? If there's another relatively risk-free asset, why not? Is it defined which, you know, they can be repackaged in some sense, one to the other one. Why, how is it pinned down how much of the risk-free they sell to them in foreign bonds versus uh, dollar bonds? Or, or is there kind of like um, no end to the amount of safety premium that they can generate for them by selling dollar bonds? Um. So let me let me un, 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 maybe unpack. So I mean, so first, the incomplete market feature is is key uh, for this. So there, there is a there is a demand uh, for 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 these dollar bonds. This dollar bond cannot be replicated through a set of arrow securities that gives us the same um, payoffs as 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 that dollar bond. And um, this dollar bond is also not purely safe. It is really like a, it's actually risky in a hedging way. Um, and so it's got first, a negative risk, yeah. In a negative risk, yeah. So in that sense, the, 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 the so so these incomplete market features are key. So, in terms of positions, um, if we want to control the amount that agents are now taking in these positions, we need to introduce idiosyncratic risk, and we do that in the appendix in order to prevent the risk tolerant investors to taking excessive leverage positions in. Um, in, 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 in foreign bonds relative to US bonds. So I think your question goes a little bit in this direction, what, what, what limits that trade? I mean, all of these agents are risk averse. Um, so they're not going to, they no, don't want to take uh, infinite positions, but um, we're introducing an additional feature to the model, which is also, which, which is idiosyncratic risk um, on these bonds in a disaster state. And this idiosyncratic risk somewhat controls the, 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 the willingness to hold these, these portfolios in the data. But the, the, the driving force is always the risk tolerant want to, want to borrow in dollars and if anything, go long in the foreign bond. Yeah. Um, so in terms of driving forces, um, in, this, in this baseline setting, there are only these, 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 these three driving forces. There's a productivity shock that has the possibility of a rare disaster. And the probability of that rare disaster is time varying. Um, um, it's, it's time bearing. And then finally, there are these dollar demand shocks. And just so I already said, think of them as a preference for dollar bonds. How this preference in the end ends up in the first order condition is you can, you can see here, this, um, the Euler equation for the home bond has this additional dollar demand shock omega T. When that is high, it means the investor is willing to accept a lower rate, lower return uh, on that home bond in, in expectations. In terms of parameterization, um, 
key targets of parameters are portfolio data within and across countries. So we are targeting the leverage of US corporations in the, in, in the US and the US, the net worth of US corporations. And then importantly, we're targeting the negative US net foreign asset position relative to the rest of the world, but their positive net foreign asset position in capital relative to wealth. And, well, and what that means is that, well, in both countries, there are these risk tolerant bankers, which are leveraged in both countries. And the US overall is leveraged in capital relative to the rest of the world. This dollar demand shock, as, as a primitive, we still try to constrain ourselves as much as possible. So we discipline the stochastic process of that um, dollar demand shock using the, the, the dollar convenience yields as estimated in, by, by, by Duem and Schrager. Um, and that is going, then going to be fed into the model. And then we're using global nonlinear solution techniques, which allows us to solve this model quantitatively and jointly speak about asset prices and quantities uh, in, this, in this setting. So in the remainder of the talk, I want to give you a very quick overview of how does any shock in the setting uh, redistribute wealth. Um, then I'm going to show you what does a disaster risk shock um, do in our model. And then naturally the reserve currency paradox uh, is going to emerge as it would in response to a, a growth shock. Um, and then uh, I'm going to show you why the dollar demand shock can get these co-movements right, both through some intuition intu intu and then similar impulse responses. And then I'm going to take the model to uh, some quantitative applications and show how the model is able to quantitatively match those features in the data that I talked about uh, in, in the beginning. So redistribution in this model is very simple. Uh, there's not many assets, in particular here in this um, baseline solution, there's only the home bond and there's capital. Theta is going to be also in the pictures that follow the wealth share of the US in the rest of the world. If the US is a, a leveraged investor overall, so has a negative bond position, then minus BH here is going to be positive. And so the wealth share of the US is going to rise if either returns on capital are higher or the returns, the realized returns on bonds, and I have to always say these are nominal bonds, but of course there is, there is inflation risk, so the, 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 these bonds can have um, return surprises um, if, the, if the return on these bonds uh, is, is lower. So when does RK go up? Well, when either real profits are higher than expected or the price of capital uh, goes, goes up. And on the other hand, the return on bonds uh, is, is going to fall when the dollar price level rises, so this, this debt value is inflated um, um, away. When we would also have foreign bond trading in the setting, then the exchange rate would more appear more directly and also redistribute in the setting, and the net position and bond positions uh, would play a role as well. But again, the US would be short US dollars and actually slightly long the foreign bonds in our setting, and so uh, similar dynamics would, 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 would arise. So these are the redistributive forces that you should keep in mind when I'm, when I'm going through um, the, the model now. And so I want to start to, to think about the mechanisms of our framework in response to a disaster probability shock. And so I, I'm going to do this in three steps to really tease out which features of the model matter. Um, first, I'm going to show you what the impulse responses to a disaster probability sh shock look like in a model with homogeneous risk aversion and no nominal stickiness. And then I'm going to, in a second step, introduce wage rigidity, but keep homogeneous uh, risk aversion. And finally, I'm going to go to our actual model solution that has this heterogeneity and risk aversion and the wage uh, stickings. I'm going to show you the, these, the, 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 the effects of such a shock in the three in six panels. So on, on the upper left side, you have the disaster probability shock itself, which is going up. Then the excess return on an equity claim, the real exchange rate in the upper right corner, the wealth share of the US in the lower left corner, the net foreign asset position of the US in the, in the, in the, in the bottom middle, and then finally output in the US in the, in, the, in the bottom right corner. So in response to an increase in the disaster probability, there is a, an, a fall on impact on, on, on equity returns and then a higher equity returns going forward as the price of, as the quantity um, of risk has, has increased. These agents are all homogeneous. They hold the same portfolio. So there's no redistribution through these shocks. And on impact, this disaster probability in the setting without nominal stickiness, output is actually going up, which is um, well known that in, 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 in models, in settings with intertemporal elasticity of substitution, lower than one, it's the precautionary savings motive that dominates um, the reaction to such an uncertainty shock. And so 
higher uncertainty, higher result, disaster risk probability actually stimulates um, output as there's higher precautionary savings motive. Now, this is now the key thing that changes as we introduce nominal stickiness. The demand for more precautionary savings leads to a drop in the demand for consumption, since in the model with wage rigidity, output is partially demand determined. We now get that output is falling in response to this disaster probability shock. But there is still no heterogeneity in portfolios, and so there is no redistribution across countries, and therefore also no changes in relative demand and no changes in, in, in real exchange rates. So finally, now I'm going to introduce our model where there is heterogeneity and risk aversion within and across countries. And what you see now is that in this setting now, agents hold different portfolios. Risk tolerant agents are going to be long capital and short nominal bonds. In particular, the US as a leveraged investor is going to be long capital and is going, therefore going to lose wealth in response to this initial fall in, in returns and then is going to regain its position as uh, returns, excess returns on equity are higher going forward. And that is then what is tracing out here the relative wealth position of the US. In, in the beginning, there is a fall, but then going forward, the US is actually earning money as the global uh, insurer of the rest of the world. So the net foreign asset position behaves um, similarly. Now, what does this mean in terms of the real exchange rate? Well, initially the US loses wealth and then starts to regain wealth. And what that means is that in the beginning, there's actually less demand from the US for US goods, and then demand starts to rise. So rather than getting an initial appreciation and then a depreciation following such a shock, you actually get that the currency starts to appreciate after the shock is occurring as the US is accumulating wealth. And this goes now at, at the core of what this reserve currency paradox as in any setting in which the US loses net worth in response to this shock, um, um, there's going to be a force that is going to lead to an initial depreciation of the dollar rather than appreciation of the dollar as we see it in the, in the data in, in bad times. And this is exactly Matteo Maggiore's uh, reserve currency paradox. Can I ask you yeah. two, two quick things? One, can you say again, uh, clarify, why does output uh, go down now as opposed to up given that the other, presumably the precautionary savings effect still happens here because the probability of a disaster went up. Absolutely. So, so let me answer first that one. So the, the, the precautionary savings motive is key. The precautionary savings motive leads to a decline in the demand for consumption. Um, normally now there would be a flexible adjustment in the, in the real rate. Um, and uh, the precautionary savings would overall lead to, to more savings and more capital and more labor um, um, supply in, in, in even in the initial period, which all these forces raise capital uh, raise output um, in a world with the, where the intertemporal SSC of substitution is below one. Now with nominal stickiness, the real rate cannot adjust. Output is demand determined and demand on impact falls exactly because there's this precautionary savings motive. Agents want to save more, want to consume less. In a new Keynesian setting, this decline in consumption now leads to a recession. It, it, the only thing I don't, all that is clear. Why isn't, because you, you have a little Taylor rule in there, why isn't the central bank accommodating the decrease in the real rate. Why, don't, yeah, why so, doesn't it? So this is, I mean, this is the, 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 we, we don't, we, the, the, ta the Taylor rule is here not uh, replicating the natural rate. That's key for that. But, but is there, what's the motivation? Why wouldn't they want to accommodate it here? Why, why don't they? Um, I guess that depends on so as parameters in which they, uh, in, 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 in which they can, uh, and in which they could do that. The, uh, what they want to do will depend on the weights on the inflation, their inflation targeting and their output targeting. Mm -hmm. um, um, key for us here is that the, the response is not optimal. Otherwise, I agree with you. There would be no, there would, this, 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 this would not happen in this way. The other question I had is, do you, uh, so, so panel two in the top row, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's like the risk premium, right? The excess return, sorry. It's a, realized, it's a realized excess return on equity, yeah. Uh, do you have the, none of these is the price per se of the claim, right? The equity claim. No, um, I, I have, so I have the price on the equity claim I don't have. I have the price on capital I can show you if you want. Okay. So uh, here is, um, da -da -da -da. Here, here is the price of capital, um, how, how the price of capital is developing in, 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 in this setting. So, and that, so 
price of capital falls by about two basis point, two and a half basis points, and then equity is levered. Equity and that is causes good. the, um, if you go back to the previous, that causes the wealth distribution to shift. Oh, oh that wasn't it. Um, yeah. That causes the wealth oop, distribution to shift by, it's hard to say, a couple basis points. By a couple of base points. This is the so this is importantly this is the this is the U.S. Um, um, wealth distribution. There is of course also wealth distribution within each country, which mm -hmm. is much there. There the redistributive effects are much larger. Suppose suppose though that you had a regular stock market move, like stock markets move all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, they move way more than two basis points, right? A typical day in the stock market is one uh, percent. Um, wouldn't that just normal moves in the stock market have much bigger redistributive effects than this than the effect we're looking at here. I mean, this is like a, it's, a, it's a small increase. I mean, this is I think a bit of a question of magnitudes. <laughs> this is a small increase in the in the uh, increase of disaster probability. Um, I mean, I won't go I won't, I won't go back now. In the appendix of the slides, you see how much is the eater that we show in this appendix of the slides is the is the redistributive effect of that shock on the within the US uh, net worth redistribution. But, but yes, I agree with you. These shocks are also redistributing and might amplify, further amplify the stock market movements as we see them in, 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 in the data. So okay. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so this is key to understand both why the shock doesn't think, get things right and where the reserve currency um, paradox uh, is, is, is coming from. And now, I want to go to the dollar demand shocks and talk about why these dollar demand shocks will get the right core movement. And we're going to see also these core movements in the impulse responses. And to do so, it's useful to um, look at three first order conditions of an investor in, in our model. And the first um, such first order condition is the portfolio choice between the dollar bond and the foreign bond. Absent a dollar demand shock um, omega t, the discounted return on the home bond has to be equal to the discounted return on the foreign bond reswapped into home ex in, into home units, or in first order um, approximation, the the, ex the expected return differential on the home bond relative to the foreign bond in home and foreign units has to be undone by an expected dollar depreciation. Now, what does a dollar demand shock do? A dollar demand shock enters here on the left hand side and requires for this equation to either see an adjustment in the, in the, in the real rate or a, a further expected depreciation. Now, if, as in our setting, there's limited adjustment in the real rate due to nominal stickiness, there has to be this expected depreciation. And the only way to get that is by an appreciation of the dollar today. Yeah? So the dollar is ex must be expected to depreciate, appreciates today. Then we can look at, this, at a similar portfolio choice condition between the dollar bond and capital. And again, the dollar demand shock enters here on the left-hand side and means that now the inv investors will require a higher expected return on capital relative to the return on, 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 on bonds. So dollar demand depresses the, the returns of the dollar bond relative to, to, to capital. And finally, to understand the real effects of this, of, of this um, dollar shock, we can look just at the Euler equation of the investor for the dollar bond itself. And just for simplicity and only here, not in the solution of the model, I want to quickly assume that the investor has log utility such that we have here a very simple pricing kernel that we can plug in. And then of course, normally the expected consumption growth would be linked to the expected return that the investor is getting. The dollar demand shock means the investor requires higher expected consumption growth. And now again, absent an adjustment here in the real rate, this is, will be therefore a direct translation uh, into higher expected consumption growth in, in the economy, how can we get higher expected consumption growth? Well, only through a fall in consumption today. And so this is exactly where now these new Keynesian effects come in. The, 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 the higher savings motive uh, leads uh, to a decline in demand today that leads to a recession and then rationalizes this higher consumption growth um, going, going forward. So these three mechanisms uh, where everywhere the dollar demand shock enters they are then key to see why our model now can get the, 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 the core movements right as we see them in the data. And again, I'm going to go through the three different solutions to the model. First, with no risk reversion uh, heterogeneity and no nominal stickiness, then with risk aversion heterogeneity, and finally, 
um, uh, no, with, with nominal stickiness and then with uh, heterogeneity and nominal stickiness. The same uh, six panels, except here on the upper left is now a different shock. It is now the dollar demand shock that goes up. So dollar demand uh, goes up in a setting uh, without rigidity, without heterogeneity, the agents hold the same portfolios. There are effects on the, on the returns. We saw the dollar demand shock drives a, a, a wedge between the return on capital and the, and the risk-free rate. But agents don't hold differential portfolios, so there's no redistribution, and the real rate can freely adjust. So there's also not going to be any real effects um, uh, of, of such a dollar demand shock. Again, this changes when we introduce nominal rigidity. Now, this higher savings demand, the drop in, in, in consumption demand, leads to a recession today. This recession will be more severe in the US because there it is now where initially wages are too high relative to where they, where they should be. Um, and so output falls in the US, also falls abroad, but by falls by more in, in, in the US, which then rationalizes this appreciation that we had also already um, posited from the first order condition when we, when we looked at them. Still, there's very limited effects on, on wage differentials now across countries. And so we barely see any movements in the, in, the, in the wealth across countries and the net foreign asset positions. And for that, we again need to introduce the heterogeneity and risk aversion. Now, the US is a, is a levered investor, borrowing in dollars, investing in capital. The dollar appreciates, the debt becomes more valuable, and uh, we, are, we are going into a recession. Capital profits uh, go down and, and the price of capital falls. Both of that leads to a fall in the, in the net worth uh, of the US relative to the rest of the world, leads to a fall in the net foreign asset position. Um, and now this dollar demand shock gets all of the cool movements that we want uh, right, the dollar depreciates um, going forward in periods in which excess returns are high, in which output is rising, and in which the US net foreign asset position is rising. And that's all just exactly as in the data. I'm just going to quickly put here these, these cool movements between excess returns output, excess returns net foreign asset position, and importantly, exchange rates with output, exchange rate with the net foreign asset position, and excess returns um, and, and exchange rate movement. And in particular for the exchange rate movements, the, the dollar demand shock is key. In the right column, you see what our model would produce when there was no dollar demand shock and only the other driving forces in, 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 in our setting. And so you see this dollar demand shock is now really what gets the exchange rate movements right and overcomes uh, the reserve currency paradox. And with these core movements at hand, I now want to go. Well, Mart, one more clarifying question here. If you could go Thank back you. Two slides. Yeah. Suppose in some models people have written down the dollar demand shock uh, is only felt by the foreign investors. Mm -hmm. um, here it's both, right? They both they both love dollars. Um, so how do you think things would be different if it was only the foreign investors who suddenly felt the demand for dollars? Okay, so I think this is a question that is much easier to come back to when I show you the extensions of the model in which the debt quantities actually matter. Um, and then with, so I'm going to come, let, let me come sure, back to your sure. question. Sure, I think sure, in sure. our current setting, it is much, it is harder to think about uh, uh, um, um, that. Although this, these first order conditions that I show you, they should just still then hold for the foreign, foreign investors. So I would think um, that they are... Um, well, tell you what. Let's tell you what I have in mind. Mm -hmm. Right now, when right now they um, they all love their dollars extra. You know, it's kind of this dividend that they get that makes mm -hmm. them uh, mm -hmm. makes them happier. Mm -hmm. So when it goes up, you want to save more. But if if this domestic investors didn't feel that way, and it was only the the foreign investors, then from the point of view, they would make the bonds more expensive, but from the domestic investors point of view, that would look like, that would look like it's just, uh, you know, yeah, low, so then, think, low real interest rate. Yeah, so I think that's fair. So I think, I think it's important. It's important. Um, I think that makes sense. So I think if it's important that the US investors also feel this increase in the dollar demand. So I think that's a fair, that's, I, I completely agree with that point. So we need, I think that the dollar demand shock also enters um, into the US first order conditions. Um, no, I don't, so I, no, I, I so I, let's, let's still come back to, to, to this. 
what is important is that there's a deflationary force uh, in, in, on, on the US policy rate. And I think that would persist if, 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 if it, but probably be somewhat muted if this uh, deflationary force was driven by a demand for dollar bonds, like a savings glut in the early 2000s that comes from abroad, but is still putting pressure on the, on the nominal, on the policy rate um, at home. So I think that would, that would persist, but let's come back to this maybe in the end of the discussion. Um, and then also, I, I think, especially when we introduce that quantities as becoming, will become even more important. But I have to think more about it, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, Okay, so now I take those cool movements to three uh, empirical applications, the dollar carry trade, the valuation channel in, in, in US and external adjustments, and then the global financial cycle. So first, the dollar carry trade, um, which is the, um, uh, which we start here from, from the, the excess return, the realized excess return on Investing in a foreign bond, swapping it back into a home currency, U.S. currency, and financing that position with borrowing in U.S. dollars. And then this is the realized uh, uncovered interest rate parity return. So in the data, empirical research has shown that first, this uncovered interest rate parity return is predictable. Higher return differentials between foreign bonds and home bonds, foreign bonds and U.S. dollar bonds, um, predict excess returns. Uh, on, on that strategy by more than one to one. And importantly, um, this, these, these, these carry trade returns are counter cyclical as shown by Lasse, Rostanov and Vernlo, that in bad times when output growth has been low, going forward, these um, um, carry trade returns will be even higher. Our model can naturally replicate these features. First, going forward, in times of high dollar demand, carry trade returns are, are high as there's the, 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 the gap between the dollar um, bond return and the foreign bond return and risk premia also endogenously through the redistribution channel um, are higher as wealth has been redistributed away from the risk tolerant uh, to, to the risk averse. Now these are also bad times. Output growth has been low exactly because these, these flight to safety shocks um, have realized. And so now um, our model is replicating the counter cyclicality uh, in, in, in output and the, the, the predictability of these carry trade returns. Without these dollar demand shocks, we would, of course, not get this counter cyclicality. Uh, so then oh, I, I want to show you, um, I want to speak to the, uh, what, what Gorinchas and Ray um, have shown in, in terms of the, the, the predicting power of the US net external position, which we thought fo just following them define as a linear combination of the US net foreign asset position and uh, exports less imports. So the net external position is low when US net foreign assets are low and when the US is exporting little and importing uh, a, a lot. So in the data, the US net external position, when it is low, is partially rebalanced through going forward, higher excess returns on their asset position and uh, and a depreciation um, of the dollar. And so because the US is a levered investor, the higher excess returns help to re push up the, net, foreign, the net, net external position again. And the depreciation of the dollar is also going to lower the value of the US debt. And so a low um, net external position predicts then forward go going forward, higher excess returns on equity and the depreciation of the ex ex exchange rate, as you see here in the data and our model um, naturally captures that, and in particular for the um, for the exchange rate movements, it's cr crucial that we have this dollar demand shock um, as, as, as we see it in the data. Why is this? Well, a dollar demand shock leads to a decline on impact in the net external position. Net foreign assets fall, net worth of the US is falling, but going forward now, the exchange rate is going to depreciate after its initial appreciation and excess returns going forward are going to be higher. All of that is going to push the net external position back to to where it came from before that shock. And so we can replicate using this dollar demand shock these, this valuation channel in, 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 um, that has been shown in the data. Gorinjas and Ray go further and say we can now decompose the variation in this net external position in news about future net export growth, which is the, the more standard trade channel, and these movements in future excess returns on the net foreign asset, on, on the net external position. And I'm going to call here beta R the share 
in this variation of the net external position that is due to news about future returns rather than future news about future net export growth. And in the data, this is about one third um, that is due to news about future returns. And our model um, replicates not only the sign, but also uh, quantitatively uh, this, this important role of future returns on the, on the, on, on the um, valuation of the net external, uh, on the valuation channel of the net external position. Without this dollar demand shock, we wouldn't even have uh, sufficient movements in the net external position to speak to these, um, to these facts. So yeah, that, 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 is, that is on the valuation channel. And now finally, um, um, I'm coming back to Itamar's very initial questions on the monetary uh, stuff and, and, and risk premium. Um, how can our model now speak to these asymmetric effects of monetary policy to the global financial cycle? And so to start, I'm again going to the impulse responses in our model, and I'm showing you here the, the model reaction to an expansionary monetary policy shock. And what does this expansionary monetary policy shock do? Well, it lowers the nominal rate on impact. It's stimulating the economy. It's expansionary. There's an initial um, rec uh, ex excess return on equity. Um, and that excess return on equity is driven partially by inflation, on, 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 uh, which lowers the return on bonds and an increase in the price of capital, um, which increases the returns on, 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 on capital in this levered equity position. The levered investors are gaining a response to this expansionary monetary policy shock. They are short uh, nominal debt, which now has lower returns, and they are long uh, risky capital, which now profits from both higher dividend payouts and a higher price of capital, all of which is redistributing to the risk tolerant agents. The US is a risk tolerant agent, is gaining uh, net worth within the US. There's risk tolerant agents that are gaining net worth, and even in the foreign country, there are risk tolerant agents that are gaining net worth in response to this monetary policy shock. All of which is lowering the risk premium in 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 in, in our model, and so US monetary policy here has effects, strong effects on um, risk premium, or as I'm going to show you as as we see them in the data. Now, foreign monetary policy has similar effects in the sense that an expansionary monetary policy shock abroad that is lowering the nominal rate leads to a, a, a stimulation in the economy, which increases uh, excess returns in foreign units. But you see here, the inflation response in terms of the home good is much more muted. And what, what this leads to is that investors that are short dollars and long capital are gaining much less in response to such a monetary policy shock. And so how we see that is here that there's a much more muted response on the US wealth share. Foreign monetary policy doesn't have the same effects on the liability side of the US balance sheet. And what that means is that the uh, excess return, expected excess returns change by much less in response to a foreign monetary policy shock rather than um, a home monetary policy shock. And this is, these asymmetries are even more striking given that we have calibrated the US to be roughly one fifth of the world as we see it in the data. So this foreign monetary policy shock is a shock in which a four fifth of the world change their monetary policy while the US keeps their monetary policy the same. Nevertheless, in terms of changing the global price of risk, these shocks um, don't have the same uh, effect. And this is of course the natural application of our previous paper in which we studied these redistributive effects of monetary policy on risk premium. But here we do so now in the, in the international context and can uh, talk to these asymmetric effects um, of monetary policy. And maybe the easiest way to compare these effects and, uh, uh, to the data and summarize them is to, to, to do a campbell schiller decomposition and ask these initial excess returns that we see in response to monetary policy, both at home and abroad, to what extent can we explain them by news about future dividend growth, news about future real rates, and news about future excess returns? And uh, it's well established that, of course, in the US, and, and, and this is also where, where Itamar has worked, it's like in the US, a lot of um, um, the effects of, of monetary policy are explained by news about future excess returns rather than about changes in real rates and changes about dividend growth. So that really these risk premium are key transmission channel of US monetary policy. Now we do the same here for the Euro area. The key is the monetary policy shocks abroad seem to have much less effects on risk premium. Our, our measurements here are much more noisy, but we build on a much larger literature um, that has shown this more precisely and for, 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 for different um, central banks 
that monetary policy outside of the US seems to have much weaker, if not even negative effects uh, on, on, on excess returns. Um, and our model can naturally capture these asymmetries. In a foreign monetary policy shock in our model has absolutely no effect on risk premia, while the whole monetary policy shock is redistributing uh, far more to the risk tolerant and thereby uh, moving risk premia up, um, capturing the, 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 the asymmetries as we see them in the data. So th this brings me now back, um, and we had this discussion already, these effects now, of course, importantly driven by the fact that we have constrained investors to only borrow in the dollar uh, and not borrow in the, in the foreign bond. Uh, and this is, here's now the, 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 the key thing that like, even if we would allow for trading in, in the foreign bond, risk tolerant investors would not want to do so, would not only not want to do so in the US, but even elsewhere in the world, risk tolerant investors will want to borrow in dollars uh, because it is cheaper to do so. And by doing so, they can uh, ensure uh, the, the, the risk averse. And so then endogenously, risk tolerant investors will have this exposure to the dollar, which means that US monetary policy redistributes um, wealth to them when it is expansionary and thereby changes risk premia uh, in the data. So... Moritz, you have two minutes. Two minutes, perfect. So, so Item already touched upon this. So the Taylor rule is of course um, uh, in, in important here. What does the Taylor rule react to or what does monetary policy react to? Um, uh, in our setting, one question is to ask, can, what if the central bank reacts more to, to, to the output gap than we are currently modeling it? Another question is, should the, should the central bank react to these dollar demand shocks? And I always think of like the, the Alan Greenspan's reaction to, to the savings glut in the early 2000s, uh, very much uh, driven by the question of, should we deviate from the uh, Taylor rule uh, in response to, to this, these dollar demand shocks? Maybe m even more um, uh, interestingly and current, currently relevant is to ask how does government debt policy and the recent swap lines of central banks um, affect uh, real outcomes in our setting. Our current setting cannot sp speak directly to these effects because at the moment, as I showed you, the, 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 in the first order conditions of the investors, only the dollar demand shock appeared. Now, we have generalized our preference shock to also depend on the amount of debt held, bonds, dollar bonds held by each agent. And in that moment, now aggregate debt quantities matter. And this is also where I want to come back to, to Itamar's question, what is like the demand comes from foreign and when, when, when the demand comes only from home. Um, in such a setting, uh, as the aggregate debt demand changes, either because foreigners ask for more or the central bank provides additional swap lines, we now get um, a dependence of the equilibrium bond prices also on the debt quantities. So you can think of our current setting that I showed you today as a flat line here, while in our generalized setting now, um, we not only have shifts of this curve up and down, but now as there is elasticity of the price of, of um, dollar bonds with to the quantity, we can also think about shifts in, 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 in the dollar um, supply. And so I hope next time you see this paper, we can show you quantitative results uh, on, 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 on these kinds of policy rules and in particular, the, the central bank swap lines. So with that, I come to a conclusion. So in this project, we try to rationalize um, the unique features of the dollar in a joint uh, a setting. Um, it's important that we need these new Keynesian frictions to get the output uh, movements right. There's incomplete markets to get the appreciation of the dollar in response to these shocks. But then importantly, there are these time varying dollar demand shocks. The fly to dollars in the setting leads to a dollar appreciation, uh, has leads to a global recession a rise in risk premium and a decline in the US net foreign asset position, all the co-movements that we see them in the data, which then allows us to get the, the evidence on the carry trade right on this valuation channel and US external adjustments, and also on the global financial cycle in terms of the monetary policy asymmetries. And as I said, uh, next time you see the paper, I hope we can tell you much more about the alternative policy rules in such a framework. And I'm looking forward to more of Itamar's questions and thoughts. Thank you, Moritz, for the great presentation. Now I will give the mic back to Itamar for his uh, few minutes of discussion. Okay, let me share screen again. Um, here we go. So um, I'm not going to add much, but uh, so some of these questions definitely Moritz talked about just now, but. Uh, I did not know that going in, but some, in some sense, it's, it's, I think it's worth repeating. So one thing that uh, we talked about, and I think this 
is in a lot of models um, happens and uh, uh, but there is something else going on here. Let me say uh, also what that is. Uh, is uh, a lot of models are written around the idea of a financial accelerator kind of effect, like you see in uh, Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist, which is you get a shift in the wealth distribution. Uh, in their model, it's, it's, it's not really wealth, it's, it's like firm capital, but basically since people have moved that idea to intermediation, it's in the wealth distribution, uh, the equity of banks or the, the, the wealth of risk takers, and that causes a shift in the price of risk. Uh, now, that is certainly qualitatively uh, correct and an interesting mechanism, but from my experience thinking about this, I think it has a very difficult time having a meaningful quantitative impact. And it's not that hard to see why. So in order, to, if what moves risk premia is shifts in the wealth distribution, well, think about what you need for that. Uh, you need one group, so you need, a, you, need a, you need some kind of shock, initial shock to the wealth distribution. And then you need the relative wealth to shift by quite a lot in order for the sort of uh, weighted average risk aversion of the economy to move a lot in order to have a knock on effect in order for let's say risk premium to go down and then to be another round of wealth shifts. Say in that case, the risk takers would benefit. Uh, so for that to happen, the risk takers need to be very, very uh, levered compared to the other group, uh, immensely levered because otherwise it will only be a small effect on their wealth. And for that to have, and then it needs to move the wealth distribution quite a bit. And moving the wealth distribution a bit based on a single shock is very unrealistic. Uh, so in the kind of the way I brought this up is in, in, in most of the models, you have like a 1%, say 2% effect. Here we were talking about a few basis points. And uh, even with immense amounts of leverage that just simply can't move the wealth distribution more than a few basis points. Whereas normal shocks to the stock market of a few percentages, say one, 2%, should then have a much, say at least as big of an effect, if not a bigger effect. And it's not just this paper, there are many, many papers based on this. And we don't typically think of them as causing huge fluctuations in the kind of things we're interested in, for example, uh, exchange rates. So um, now there is a different uh, channel here, which is the initial shock is this dollar demand shock. And that in a sense raises the borrowing cost directly, not working through um, the wealth distribution. And so I think that is really the powerful channel rather than this knock on effect of moving the wealth distribution. Um, and so I think that's the more promising channel quantitatively. Uh, but this is a comment that applies, like I said, I think even more to, uh, to many other models out there that like this qualitative balance sheet channel, people call it the balance sheet channel, but I think ultimately it's, it's, it's not a very uh, powerful effect. When we, in the model that we wrote, it also is in there, but it's not the main event whatsoever. It's really the effect of monetary policy on borrowing costs directly rather than through the knock-on effect. Uh, the second question, and again, I think it, this goes to a bit the convenience yield um, mic, the micro foundation for it. It also goes to this extension of their model where they talk about what if, you know, how do you limit the supply of the safe asset is, you know, is this convenience yield or safety premium, does this apply to all sort of more or less risk-free assets, such as those produced by, by firms or, or financials, like let's say, um, commercial paper, or you know, some papers talk about mortgage-backed securities, uh, or not, or does it just apply to government bonds? So, if it applies only to government bonds because it's the special safety of the U.S. government, then it's clearly limited by how much the U.S. government wants to produce, and they may not produce it. If they need other reasons to produce it, but if it's a lot, if the financial sector can produce it, then it's not clear why they should they shouldn't just satiate this demand and drive down the safety premium to zero. Uh, that's in general, I think, an issue for the safety liquidity premium literature. And again, we've, my co-authors and I, Alexi and Philip, have worked on this a lot. In our deposits channel paper, it's because banks have market power. And if they produce a lot of uh, these government backed assets called deposits, they lose the very big uh, spreads that they make on those things. So they're, they're a monopolist. And so they naturally constrict quantity. But in a lot of the models we're talking about here, 
they're, unless it's the government, in which case they're not strategic about it, they just don't increase it, it's not clear why you wouldn't have firms just issue the hell out of this thing to maximize the premium that they can capture and then it would go down to zero. And then the last question we did talk about, which is uh, why isn't the central bank here fully accommodating changes that should happen in the real rate and therefore kind of taking the real effects out of it. But we, we Mars already discussed that, so I, um, it's kind of repetitive. Uh, great, thanks so much, Itamar, for a great discussion. So I want to give Moritz a chance to respond to uh, Itamar before going to audience questions. And for the audience, please, if you have a question for sure, raise your hands and we will call on you. So Moritz. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Itamar. So these are like uh, very uh, valuable points. And I um, want to first agree on point one and then push back on point one. Um, so I agree that like to get large movements in risk premia in these models with heterogeneous wealth distribution, you need very large wealth fluctuations that um, as we don't see them in the data. Um, and so probably there's various other driving forces as we also have them changes in the quantity of risk and so on that change um, risk premia. Uh, what we show in our previous paper is that these redistributive forces that happen in response to monetary policy uh, um, are nevertheless quantitatively, even in a world with very low leverage differences. So we don't in our, in, also in this model and not in our previous paper, we don't have extreme uh, leverage of the risk tolerant agents. We really use portfolio data. Um, it is quantitatively sufficient, um, the, 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 the risk premium effects are small, but quantitatively sufficient to explain the evidence on monetary policy and, 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 and risk premium. And something similar happens here. Again, we don't have, um, uh, large uh, disparities in, in, in portfolios. And yes, the, the world redistributive effects are not giant, but again, quantitatively, they are enough uh, to, to explain the features as we see them in the data. And so this doesn't say that there are not other shocks that change returns on assets. And yes, these shocks might be amplified in the data to some extent through, um, through redistribution away from um, um, risk tolerant to risk averse. And I, I guess the, the, the model has something to say about what like a change, for example, in um, returns does to the risk premium through an amplification here uh, when disaster risk goes up and there is some amplification. Again, it is, it is, it is not as sizable as maybe the theoretical literature that was not quantitative would have hoped. Um, but yeah, I, I, for us, what, what the, the moments that we are after quantitatively, these channels can exactly capture. And so I, I so in that sense, I want to, I want to, agree on the, on the on the statement and then push back on the on the quantitative statement since our we, we really use here portfolio data as we see it in the data um and then the second point i think is very va like very valid and um um at the moment as is, is in the model this is a demand for all dollar assets and so we don't differentiate between various dollar assets and there might also be other convenience yields for example i mean you have worked a lot on like reserves relative we bought with relative to to government bonds how's that yield um difference changing and there might be other liquidity benefits we cannot talk to this in the in the current model um however to the extent that for example mortgage-backed securities are useful uh, in producing collateral uh, to, to pr producing uh, dollar assets for example in the repo market as collateral uh, these assets will of course inherit some of the benefits that this demand for safe dollar um, has to the extent that they're useful to this. So we don't model it this in all this richness, but I think um, uh, there's going to be pass through on, 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 on all dollar assets, even in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a richer setting. So finally, why is this not fully satiated? Um, in the setting with this dollar demand shock, there are payoff characteristics. No one is here risk neutral, everyone is risk averse. So even the risk averse, even the risk tolerant, but still risk averse agents will care about the inherent uh, hedging properties of the dollar, dollar asset. And so even if in the end we can tra trade freely and um, ensure each other perfectly, uh, there is still going to be an agreement on that dollar bonds are safer than foreign bonds since they appreciate in, in bad times. Um, that said, uh, I think we are not thinking at the moment enough, and that's where we're going at the moment about quantities. And I hope when we do that, then we can speak and answer much more directly to your to your point two. And as you said, point three we uh, we, we we discussed already. And so now I'm happy about all the questions. And thank you so much, Itama, for for the discussion. Uh, okay, great. So uh, now let's move to our first question, Vanya uh, Savrek. Sorry, I can't pronounce your last name. It's harder than mine. 
Savrakeva from LBS. Vanya, can you thank please? Thank you so question? much for the thank you for the great paper. So actually, I have two questions. So the first one I want to ask the authors. So essentially, the flight to safety literature, both the existing theoretical and empirical literature, and kind of the competing uh, explanations to this paper, are that you have either some kind of shock that lowers real GDP growth or changes downwards revisions of future real GDP growth, which increases risk aversion, which triggers flight to safety due to the hedging properties of the dollar. So the causality is from you expect something bad to happen to the US or the world economy, and then you get the dollar appreciation. You have kind of the reverse causality. And I think it will be important for the, for the authors to try to empirically differentiate which is kind of the correct story, given that you know um, there is alternative explanation and there is actually empirical support for this alternative explanation. That's my first comment. The second one is kind of related that, um, so here it's kind of a two country model. So when we think about demand, right? So higher demand for dollars implies lower demand for the other currency. In reality, if you look at the cross country data, what we see in periods of significant dollar appreciation, this flight to safety periods, you find that the dollar appreciates against some currencies, but of course depreciates against the Swiss franc and the Japanese yen. So you have this heterogeneity that's kind of constant in the data when you have these extreme appreciations. And that's why you know, the other theory can generate this just because the, the yen and the Swiss franc actually, they're not, the dollar is not a hedge with respect to those currencies, right? So you don't get this uh, flight to safety. So I'm just pushing the others a little bit to link better their work. Uh, I mean, I, I, I will talk to, Ro to Rohan already, so we'll discuss it. So it's okay if, if, if they decide to not answer everything, but that, these are my comments. No, yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let me quickly answer. These are, these, are, these are good comments and also important for me to, 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 to clarify, for us to clarify. Um, so on the first one, um, in, the, in the appendix of the paper, we have, so we, we treat this kind of like the, the dollar demand shock as something very um, abstract because we want to kind of clarify that um, what is really needed is a time varying dollar demand, whether this is driven by time varying demand for dollar liquidity or flight to safety through to uh, changes in expectations about of future haircuts or, or, or so on. Um, the, the effects are going to be the same. I think a key difference between some of the stories that you're saying and, and, and how our current calibration of the model is that there's no correlation um, uh, between in, in here with, for example, the disaster risk story, which like one of the stories that you mentioned, for example, um, would have. Nevertheless, it, it, if, if they were correlated, for example, an increase in disaster risk would also trigger this flight to dollars at the same time. What our model says is the flight to dollars would lead to an initial uh, to an additional recessionary force just through that flight to dollars that is triggered by this additional disaster risk. And so I think they are they are connected and we're trying to highlight that actually the dollar demand itself is, is already enough to get these co-movements right. And I also want to highlight that that we're not saying that our story is different than those 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 those, those, those stories at all. And um, um, we are uh, we are we are really like building on the on, on that literature, connecting it to the to the to to the, the US as a, as, a, as, a, as a global insurer. Um, and it's this bridge, which then I, I think captures a lot of patterns jointly, which haven't been uh, studied jointly in, in, in a framework. But this is not, I don't, I don't see our paper as an alternative story uh, to that. And, and Rohan should ch ch chime in here if, 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 if he wants to add something. And then because of this role of the, so then I also agree with your points on the Swiss franc and, 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 and the, the um, and Japan and so on. So I think what is important here is there is a maybe a flight to reserve currencies. The US is not the only reserve currency. One of the key thing is that the dollar is a reserve currency issued by a very overall levered investor. And, and so maybe these other currencies um, look in that sense a bit different. But um, of course, our, our two country model cannot capture this richness in the data. But, but we agree that we are missing a lot of the core movements in that, in, in that, in that sense there. But from the dollar's perspective, it is again this bridging between the dollar as a reserve currency and the U.S. as a global, the global banker um, that that gets now all these co-movements for us, right? For the U.S., which would look different for these other currencies. But your, your points are well taken. Uh, okay, great. So let's move to the next question. Nabin, uh, Hana, please ask your question. Oh, so I think my question is much more general. I think some of it has already been touched on. So I was just wondering, so what uh, do the authors believe is making the dollar such uh, an attractive, safe asset? And given that we are creating so much, so many deficits at this particular point in time, is there potentially a threshold where uh, it's going to lose its attractiveness uh, to some of the other uh, safe assets which are 
also available as substitutes? Yeah, I, so I, I think that's, um, so, so we cannot speak to this. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question to study what would happen in, in such a framework if there would be a switch from, from one reserve currency to the other, as maybe has happened in the, um, from, the, from the British pound to, to, to the dollar at some point and might now happen again. Um, um, and yeah, we, 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 we cannot talk to that. Um, and I think similarly, we cannot speak to why we take, we take the, the, the flight to the dollar um, as a given. And, and I think we have, we have, we have like, we, we would need these micro story, micro funded, small micro funded stories of, for example, like, yeah, differences in, in haircuts in, 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 in crisis, which maybe become more difficult, as you say, as the fiscal position of the US is changing, or the US as this, this payment instrument in, in global US financial markets. Um, more, more, more serious to actually speak to why I don't know if Juan has, wants, wants to add something on it. No, yeah. But, but it's a, it's a, I, I completely agree with you that this is a key question of how would, in such a world, the, the macroeconomy react if there's a sudden switch away from the dollar? And how, but, but we cannot unfortunately speak to it yet, but maybe in a, in a, in a future paper. Great, thanks. Um, okay, thanks so much, everybody, for coming and for the talk and discussion and for all the questions. Um, so next week, we're going to have uh, Svetlana <coughs> and Bryce Golova, sorry for the worst pronunciation, from again, LBS, uh, who will talk about uh, Bayesian solutions for the factor zoo. Um, and our discussion would be Brian Kelly from Yale SOS. So thanks a lot for coming and hope to see you next week. Thanks a lot, everyone.